Now, uh, this is where uh, your, your organizers might be a bit sad that they invited me because I'm going to talk to you a bit about evolution, which is completely not relevant for um, uh, visual cognition. You might think anyways, it is very relevant for this test. Um, specifically, uh, this is like this cusp is not unique to humans. Um, our closest ancestor, or the, sorry, not ancestors, our closest living relatives, bonobos and 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 chimpanzees. The graph I'm showing you is from a really cool study by Celine uh, Sarabian, um, and it, it, essentially what she's showing is that if you put slice of banana on or very close to poo, um, the slices that are furthest away are most likely to be eaten by bonobos. So you know there seems to be some basic disgust avoidance. That said, um, disappointingly, perhaps, they still eat the slices you know, directly adjacent to uh, the poo, very much in contact with it, about you know, slightly over 30% of the time. Humans do not do this. Um, and in one of the my favorite studies of all time, this is Paul Rosen and colleagues, um, essentially what they did is they, uh, they have a bunch of different types of stimuli that look like they might be disgusting, um, but in reality aren't. So um, best example of that, and this is a real screenshot from the method section, um, is uh, they presented some high quality, they felt the need to stress that, um, chocolate fudge. Uh, and they do so in two different types. So one of them is just standard square uh, piece of fudge. And the other one is shaped in, I quote, a surprisingly realistic piece of dog feces. Mind you, chocolate fudge. Participants are told it's chocolate fudge. It's just shaped like it looks like a dog poop. And then they're asked, you know, which one do you want to eat? And basically nobody goes for the, the dog feces shaped uh, piece. And this is the same across different types of things. If you have a completely sterilized cockroach, dip it into a glass of, of lemonade. People don't want to drink that anymore. Um, there's this kind of almost magical contamination property that we assign to things that, that look like or have been in touch with um, uh, disgusting um, stimuli. So clearly, humans have this much more high-strung um, um, disgust avoidance than, than our closest ancestors do. And that seems to suggest that over time somewhere, we developed this. And one pet peeve of mine in the literature is that we are moving towards a, a literature where people claim that this is a very much biologically, genetically oriented piece of evolution. So there's slightly older theories on, on how disgust you know, came to be or disgust avoidance came to be in humans uh, or it came to be so high, high strung in humans. Uh, so people like Paul Rosen would say, this is a, a thing that you know, probably developed as a, a typical, like you know, the people who have the, the fittest set of genes who are the most disgust avoidant, they have the lowest chance of dying from random illness they picked up uh, through something they should have been eating. And therefore, you know, those genes survive. But more importantly, there's also a strong cultural element to this. Uh, cultural evolution, we'll go to it into in a second. Um, but it's in this case, essentially familial transmission. So as parents, you convey to your children that you just shouldn't put poop in your mouth. It's bad. You don't want to do that. Or, you know, any of the other disgusting things you might find in the wild. It takes a while, by the way, for children to get this. Um, about three to five years, specifically. Um, I have a baby right now. He'll happily put his hand down when you're changing him, grab whatever he can grab on his nappy, and then you know smear that across his face. He has no objections to that, and that is basically true until about three to five years of age. Um, it takes a wee bit for it to kick in, and that's actually something that Rosin and colleagues picked up on and were like, "Well, so this might be acculturated." The second, more recent kind of line of thinking is by people like Josh Tyler, and essentially they are claiming that such late onset doesn't necessarily mean that something is familiarly transmitted, um, because other things develop later as well. So one example that Tyler often uses is secondary um, uh, sexual characteristics. They develop in puberty, and it's not that you know you talk to your children and therefore suddenly they develop hair all over the place. They, they just do that because of a, a genetic escape. So it's, you know, that's an argument and, and, and it's a good argument in the sense that late onset um, behaviors don't always mean that they are culturally transmitted. Um, and essentially Tyra goes on to, to basically claim that, you know, this is probably mostly biological evolution and 
there might be some kind of cultural aspects that kind of calibrate specific disaster responses. So for example, in Western countries, you might be a bit more put off by eating insects and in, um, in other countries um, or by you know, whatever specific food that it is that your country doesn't like. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's small beans. Um, so there's this huge focus on um, genetic transmission rather than cultural transmission. Um, there's some evidence for this, I should argue. Um, so both of these papers are from uh, um, just Diver and colleagues. And essentially what they use is, is twin design. Um, and a twin design is essentially what you look at the trait, um, let's call the trait Y. Uh, you take the trait in two uh, sets, of, in a, instead of siblings, so two siblings. Some of these are um, monozygous twins, some of these are dizygous twins. Uh, so essentially in monozygous uh, twins, almost the entire genome is the same between two twins because they're, you know, identical twins in common parlance. Um, Dizagus twins don't have that. Um, they're, they're like other siblings. They share roughly 50% of their genetic material on average. And the idea is essentially, therefore, if you compare um, you know, identical twins and non-identical twins to each other, you should be able to figure out which components are through shared environment, parental modeling, and which uh, components in their behavior are potentially genetically influenced. You often see this ACE model where essentially, uh, what we're trying to map is the genetic impacts of A on the, the traits in both children. So these are uh, genetics that are the same in monozygous twins and like 50% overlap in dizygous twins. Um, they share the same environment. So they, they, they are both brought up in the same family. Um, and they also share non, -sh sorry, they, they don't share non-shared environments. So this is kind of uh, measurement error and other things that can play a role in shaping a trait. Um, now, what these studies very often kind of gloss over or kind of mention as an aside and then proceed to ignore is that actually a child's genetics interacts with the child's shared environment. So if you are a certain way, people treat you a certain way. If you have more of a tendency to stick poop in your face, you're going to have an environment that discourages that more so than if you're a child who didn't have that same, um, same tendency. So there is a confounding between shared environments and genetics. And uh, in fact, if you, if you, you know, simulate uh, data in twin studies, um, heritability estimates are hugely overestimated and shared environments are underestimated as a function of this genetic compound. Uh, so in this particular set of graphs, um, the uh, dash line here is essentially the, 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 true, um, the true value. The dotted line is if you uh, were to account for the fact that you know, there has been some confounding and these are the estimates that you take out. So hugely underestimating even the, the true um, genetic effect. Uh, sorry, the true shared environment effect, hugely overestimating the true um, heritability, so genetic effect. Another thing is the heritability isn't just genetics, but people seem to gloss over that in these kind of twin studies as well. So bottom line, um, arguing on the basis of twin studies that show a high heritability and no shared environmental influence is not a good piece of evidence against familial transmission because these tools are fundamentally flawed and heritability isn't necessarily genetic transmission purely. Um, so we should kind of disregard this evidence, I think, for making strong claims about whether or not something is familially transmitted, uh, which is a really important thing because the familial transmission between uh, generations is what ultimately um, is cultural evolution. So I set about to kind of correct the record and, and do a study where um, we look at 100,000 years of, of evolution. Now you can't do that obviously because you can't stay around for 100,000 years and we don't really have the ability to measure traits in, in deceased people. So we have to do this in silico, in a, a simulation environment. Um, I do this in the basis of an agent-based um, simulation. And what that means is that we have a, a number of agents and just like in real life, when two agents meet and really like each other, um, certain things happen and they produce agent babies. And those agent babies just in real life get like 50% of their genetics from their, their uh, mother and 50% from their father and to recombine into a full set. And the idea is essentially that you can do this, um, but you can also uh, take into account cultural evolution. Um, cultural evolution is this baggage that you get from your parents as well. 
And it might be on something like how you use a tool. It might be based on these preferences. It's essentially what you see in your parents that shapes um, what you, know, you yourself develop as a trait. And uh, in our case, where we're going to discuss, uh, disgust. Um, so it's basically how your parents respond to disgusting stimuli. Um, one really elegant model of this, I think anyway, is by uh, Erkins and Lipo, and uh, later also actually kind of fine tune and also like, there's some estimates I'll use from this other study as well. Um, take both of them if you want to read up on this. But the idea is very simple. The trait S in the next generation, T plus one, this baby over here, is essentially the trait of the previous generation with some copying edit error. Um, so what this essentially says is that the whole process of cultural evolution is children trying to copy their parents, but doing so imperfectly. And the imperfect kind of uh, random error causes drift over time. Um, so if there was any kind of selective pressure, you would see, if there wasn't any selective pressure, you would see just drift um, in either direction without any kind of selective process. So it would stick around basically previous generations or it would kind of drift up and down a bit randomly. However, if there is a pressure, um, you know, as there, there, there generally is in, in, in nature, then you would basically select for people that erred in kind of one way and less so towards another way. Um, so in this kind of really simple, elegant, you copy, but you do imperfectly, we already have a nice system that kind of models how cultural evolution can, can happen and how it can uh, bias evolution. Um, you don't just have your parents, um, you know, there's a whole wide world out there and um, your parents aren't the only influence in your life. So <clears throat> let's say there's a, a whole you know, population out there, community that also has certain ideas about you know, what, what is or isn't disgusting. And that can also influence your, um, your own cultural um, um, uh, heritage essentially. So the idea is that you can take that into account as well. And we take that into account here as um, basically the same way as before, you copy the population with some kind of error. Um, you also see this extra lambda parameter. So there's a certain probability that you will copy the population with some error and there is one minus that probability that you will copy your parents. Um, so essentially, that's it. You either copy one of your parents or you copy the population and you do so imperfectly. Um, people have actually fitted this type of model to existing uh, data. Um, so what they find is that the lambda parameter is about you know, 38 for various things. And that can be arrowheads, it can be pots and pans, um, very kind of, uh, material things that you you make after learning how to make them and they have also found quite consistently that the error rate is about five percent as the normal distribution 0.025 um, standard deviation excellent so in in my simulation i modeled this um uh, in this kind of iterative way over generations new babies are born people die age increments some people go from child to fertile some people go from fertile to old um, all of the estimates for when this happens are based on currently existing hunter-gatherer tribes. Those are modern humans, so this is an imperfect approximation of oh, this is an imperfect approximation of old humans. Um, but you know, it's the best kind of estimates we have. And um, within the um, the fertile population, we pair up uh, basically everyone, um, and they pair up until their partner either dies or um, or they die essentially. Uh, and then some of the pairs produce babies at a rate that, again, is matched to, um, to existing hunter-gatherers. Um, now, the crucial thing is that people die. Um, and this is the Siller um, hazard function. And it basically tells you what the odds are of you dying. It's a very simple equation that essentially says, early on, you have pretty high chances of dying. Infant mortality is super high if you don't have fancy more medicine. Thread life is relatively low. And then when you get older, your chance of dying increase. These two lines that rise steeply are for uh, chimpanzees. These other are for different types of communities for humans. Um, and that function essentially is in part at least determined by um, gastrointestinal illness. So at 5.4% of people who die in existing hunter-gatherer tribes die because of um, gastrointestinal issues. And we figured maybe about 10% could have been avoided if they were more discussed prone. Um, so what we're essentially doing is taking this, this uh, existing hazard function that tells you, you know, 
early in life, you're more likely to die. Throughout life, you have a certain likelihood of dying. And you know, later in life, you have another increasing probability of dying. And we take one small part of that, gamma, only 0.0054 part of that. So a really small proportion, like half a percent. Um, and that is essentially the chance of you dying for discussed related issues. So if we tie the traits that we have now simulated in biological and cultural evolution to um, this potential gastrointestinal illnesses, we now have natural selection for disgust, um, for disgust avoidance to be specific. And if you do that, essentially what you see is that over 100,000 years, over generations, slowly people become um, more disgust avoidant. This is the cultural trait. Um, however, you see that it's less so in genetics. So if you allow mutations, it's a bit quicker. And if you don't allow mutations to occur at the rate that you know, human mutations tend to occur. So essentially what we're seeing here is that um, cultural evolution outpaces genetic evolution by a large margin um, in the context of disgust avoidance anyway. Uh, this is if you look at different types of genetic inheritance. So this is a control where there was no natural selection. So you basically see that there's no um, difference from, from random variation. Uh, if the trait, the discussed avoidance trait is polygenic, which is very likely to be because most psychological traits are, what you essentially see is a small um, uh, movement away so towards the, the fitter genes. If it's a monogenic um, with either the... Um, the less beneficial thing being dominant or the more beneficial allele being dominant, you see kind of faster transition. Um, but yeah, over time, essentially what you see is that the cultural trait develops much quicker than any of the genetic traits could be.